Good morning, Zheng Wei. Good evening, Jennifer. Uh, welcome to our second episode of Making Reproductive Longevity a Reality. I'm Jennifer Garrison. I'm a faculty member here at the Buck Institute and faculty director of the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. So the goal of the GCRLE is really to break down traditional barriers um, and foster basic scientific research um, in order to translate discoveries into novel therapeutics in order to improve reproductive health and longevity in women. Hi, and I'm Zhong Wei, a clinician scientist in obstetrics and gynecology and IVF specialist. My research focuses on unra unraveling the biology of ovarian follicular genesis to change the irrecoverability uh, of reproductive aging in women. So that, you know, uh, I hope that using large collaborative basic and translational research efforts uh, to sort of uh, discover innovative solutions to change a woman's life narrative of reproductive inevitability to reproductive longevity. Cool. Um, so we've got a really exciting program today. Uh, we're featuring two talks from uh, GCRLE grantees, and they're both focusing on trying to understand how the brain might control female reproductive physiology and how that might be important uh, during aging and, and menopause. Um, so Zhang Wei, I know that you've seen this play out in your clinical uh, patients in real life, yeah? Yes, indeed. Um, and that really brings to a case I've actually been looking after. And she is actually a woman who's unfortunately, you know, what we call the CPU, the central processing unit in the brain, the anterior pituitary, has stopped producing two vital hormones that will actually signal to her ovaries to sort of behave and respond and produce the female hormones and to get the eggs to wake up you know, and start to function. And unfortunately, it came with no periods at all. And we have to start on hormone replacement therapy to give her what a woman requires in her life, um, you know, to go through puberty, to grow up. And then now when she's married and, you know, she wants to have a child of her own, you have to start giving her injections to replace what the CPU that is, you know, long, no, never worked at all to really replace that hormones and try to get the ovaries to signals and start things going. Uh, this is really a tough journey for her. And I wonder what our scientists, you know, and how can we do research in this area to actually help these women? Back to you, Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I mean, you know that this is something that we work on in my lab um, as a neuroscientist. And I, um, I think a, a lot of people maybe don't realize that um, there's communication between the brain and the ovaries and other reproductive organs, and it goes in both directions. Um, indeed, so indeed. there are hormones and signals that the brain releases that talk to the ovaries and vice versa. And um, I think this is a really, um, I think a really exciting area of research. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker. Um, Holly Ingram is a professor and associate vice chair in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology uh, with a joint appointment in the Department of Reproductive Sciences at UCSF. And she also holds the uh, Hurstein Endowed Chair in Molecular Physiology. Um, and Holly has had a long and storied career in female reproductive uh, physiology, and she's won a lot of awards um, and accolades for her research, so I'm not going to read them all. Um, but she was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is an incredible, um, a, an incredible honor. Um, and from my perspective, I think that um, her, her biggest and most amazing achievement um, is that she directs a program called uh, the UCSF IRACDA Scholar Program. And this promotes diversity through um, giving individualized mentorship and career development training to women and minority postdoctoral fellows. Um, and this is a career stage where in science, a lot of, a lot of women and minorities end up leaving um, science because they don't get the, the attention that they need. So I think that's just amazing. And that's a program that's funded through the NIH. Um, so Holly has spent her whole career studying female reproductive physiology. Um, she studies how hormones influence the nervous system and also how age-related changes in hormone levels can alter female physiology. Um, and she's going to talk about the projects that uh, the GCRLE really funded uh, her to do, which is to understand how the brain might control things like egg quality and ovarian reserve and hormone levels during aging. So welcome, Polly. I'm really excited to hear your talk. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Um, this is great. I mean, we are just now starting to think about how we can uh, use our information to really understand how the, the brain may communicate with 
peripheral organs, including the ovaries, to affect function. So um, what I'll tell you about today are just little snippets of the kind of stuff we do. So we um, are really quite interested in how hormones af affect the brain and affect female physiology. And um, the way I think it needs to be thought of is that we have at, at different life stages, we have hormone levels change dramatically up and down, um, starting with the onset of puberty. And then of course, later with the um, with estrogen depletion during menopause. And we really have very little understanding about the hor what hormones are really doing to really key circuits that then may affect uh, reproductive physiology. So um, that's really where my lab has been focused. And we've really primarily been looking at uh, this later stage or what happens when estrogen is depleted from the brain in terms of how it affects uh, female physiology and what are the circuits that are so sensitive to, to estrogen. And um, so as I've just said there, you know, you have, you have your sort of three cornerstones in the lifespan of a woman as shown here. And of course, the idea is that if we can understand some of the molecular basis for what hormones are doing in the brain, we might be able to use alternative strategies rather than just hormone replacement that was just talked about with that one patient. So we look at this one area, uh, which is the medial basal hypothalamus, and there are three estrogen receptors. We only really look at one of these estrogen receptors because it's prominent, and that's the estrogen receptor alpha. And I just want to show you that if you look at um, in this region and you look at this pink staining here, there's two regions in the female brain, the arcuate nucleus and the VMHVL. And um, what's so interesting about sex differences is that it's still a mystery because in fact, there is estrogen receptor in the male brain. And yet we know that some of the effects of hormones are so sex dependent. And um, you know that's really the puzzle that we need to solve. So the other thing that we have found out is that estrogen signaling outcomes in the brain is not the outcomes aren't, are, are not uniform. So here, I'll just, um, if we look at different stages of the estrus cycle, and estrus when it's low estrogen, pro-estrus when it's high estrogen, I know that's confusing. Um, what I just want you to focus on here is you look at this amazing, the green pops up, which is uh, an indication of neuronal activity um, in this particular part of the brain. And you can see that here, but in another part, of the brain where you have ER alpha, that just doesn't occur. And that is a mystery to us is why, why are these different brain regions so um, different in their response to hormone? So um, our approach to study this is to use two, two different approaches. One is we can go into different brain regions and we can genetically, uh, using a, a viral approach, we can go in and ablate estrogen signaling uh, or ablate ER alpha which then ablates estrogen signaling. And then the other thing is that we can use a, a different Cree lines to go in and basically wipe out, for instance, the estrogen signaling in these two different brain regions. So this is the control and this is after we wipe it out. So, and then we can start asking what happens. And um, I'll just give you a snippet of one story that, that we published um, uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, which is really showing this incredible action of the brain on a peripheral tissue. And one of the um, surprises that we got um, in, is that we went in and knocked out ER alpha in one part of the brain and we saw this huge bone mass increase as shown here. These bones are incredibly strong. And then we went in with uh, three subsequent models to show that we could pinpoint the neurons that are mediating this effect. So um, the, these, uh, this turns out that's very interesting is that these are KISS neurons that are critical for reproduction and puberty, and yet they're having a, a control with bone on bone. So it, 
you know, it's fun to think about, you know, how, how do these, are these neurons deciding, you know, what are we going to do with bone versus what are we going to do with our reproductive organs in terms of function? Um, I will just say that we've sort of followed up because um, this finding is very significant for thinking about things like osteoporosis. And one of the things that we wanted to know, is there a circulating factor that gets released when we do this manipulation in the brain? And we've done a lot of different things that I'm not going to show you. Um, this is some unpublished data where we did this old time experiment of parabiosis, where you stitch two mice together and we stitch them together and then we do scans later on. So when we stitch a wild type, to a wild type, this is what the bone looks like. And it's really quite disintegrated. So we're looking at um, the distal femur here because it represents the bone that we look at in an older woman. And you can see there are the data. But when we stitch a wild type to a mutant, all of a sudden we have new bone formation. And so this is, um, we've, we've started nailing down the mechanism of, of this uh, effect and we are trying to find um, this factor. So this is a surprise that we, the, the brain is controlling this peripheral tissue, um, but in an opposite way of what the gonadal estrogen is doing on bone. So instead of promoting it, you're inhibiting it. And here, when you get rid of that signaling from the brain, you promote this bone formation. And what we've done, this is quite tricky. This is a, an experiment. I'm not going to go into detail, but basically we can take um, stem cells from the bone and we can put them into the brain and we can actually start creating bone in the brain from whatever is released in the brain. So this is sort of sci-fi stuff. Very cool. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is how, um, what is the, um, what is the mechanism by which uh, you actually change your, your pattern of activity to promote sexual receptivity during the menstrual cycle or the estrus cycle? And I'm just showing you here a paper um, from almost 100 years ago where in rats you can see these, this peak activity. And every time there's a peak of activity, you, that's right before ovulation and food intake goes down, activity goes up. So everything is being coordinated by the brain to make reproduction, to maximize reproductive success. And as you age, of course, this completely disappears because you no longer have those spikes of hormone. So we set out to actually understand the neurons that were responsible for this. And um, I will uh, just show you that we found one target in the VMHVL, and this is melanocortin-4 receptor. And what, we, what you can see here is that during proestrus, when estrogen is high, you get a lot of this receptor all of a sudden appearing. And I should say that in Allen's brain atlas, since that was done on males, this was actually never observed really in the VMHVL. So again, just the focus on female and female physiology is so important if we're going to understand and make a difference in women's health. Um, and this is just showing during high estrogen, you can see this, this blue signal here in that part of the brain. And this is just uh, basically looking at the transcripts for that uh, receptor. And we've done a series of experiments to show that, in fact, that this is a really important, uh, this convergence of estrogen and this melanocortin signaling are important uh, using different technologies uh, to restore melanocortin for only in that part of the brain to increase the dosage using a CRISPR-A method, which is a newer method. And it's, I think it's gonna be quite powerful in the brain if we wanna look at how we can manipulate genes and look at functions and look at, for instance, the ovary. And then we do chemogenetics where we actually stimulate those neurons. So I'm gonna show you the chemogenetics first 
um, I'm hoping the movie. And you can see here that if we activate those neurons, uh, just a, there are only about 200 neurons here that we're activating in the brain. You can see what happens to a female mouse who should really be looking like this during the lifetime and inactive. And we can, um, we can actually take uh, female mice that have their ovaries removed when they're very inactive and then make them much more active this way. Um, and then I just wanted to show you this, that using this CRISPR-A method where we can take two viral uh, constructs, a guide RNA to the melanocortin-4 gene and a Cas9, and we can basically say what happens when we just overexpress this gene ever so slightly in the VMHVL, what happens to movement, reproduction, et cetera. And so this is just um, some of the data from that experiment where we've put in the virus, you can see a spread, but we see this, you see that increase in blue. So we've increased this gene product just, um, just by about 50%. And what happens to the behavior when we do that? Well, even after four months, you can see that the female and as well as male mice that have gotten that virus where you've increased that dosage move around about twice as much in the dark. And they actually gain a little bit of bone. Um, we're looking at the reproductive function to find out, does this increase reproductive function, especially in aging animals? So this is something that, that, we're on, that is ongoing now as soon as uh, we can start really doing experiments after COVID-19. Um, so essentially what we think this, this circuit is uncovered is that during low estrogen, activity is low. And then as estrogen increases, you turn on this whole signaling pathway, turn up melanocortin-4 receptor to increase activity. And it is very interesting that one of the drugs that has been just uh, approved for uh, hyposexual dysfunction in premenopausal women is this melanocortin agonist. So that I think we think that, that that drug could be hitting these targets. Now, I think the more in the, the next phase of this, which I, I'm hoping will uh, intersect with um, the aims of, of this amazing funding, is looking at the a more a complicated, you know, what's going on with the circuit? Where are these, who are these neurons talking to? And we've worked with Jin Duan at UCSF to actually map that. Um, as shown here. So we're, we're adding virus here and then we're looking at all the places you project. And I know this is, this is a lot of neuroanatomy for some, and I'm only gonna just highlight that if you compare where these neurons project to uh, that we hit versus a much larger subset of just neurons that express estrogen receptors. So these are our neurons that also express, express estrogen receptor versus the entire subset. You can see this difference here. So we are hitting some very unique areas that they did not see when you look at the larger swath of uh, neurons. And I'll just say that most is, interestingly, they project to speed cells, which sort of gives you that sense of, you know, what your velocity of speed is and an arousal center, which actually happens to also have some estrogen receptors. So we are wondering now whether that region next to this locus ceruleus region might be important for reproduction. So um, I hope that I've given you a snapshot uh, really just of how complex the story is in the brain and how much more we have to do. I'm hoping to recruit other PIs that are interested in this subject to really go after this very large question that is so important for women's health um, by asking what are the ho other hormone sensitive clusters that could affect reproduction? How do you coordinate behavior circuits necessary for reproduction as well as reproductive physiology and hormone production? And you know what really, how is the female brain connected to reproductive output? 
comes. So our funding, um, I'll thank everyone that the, Candace Herber and Bill Krauss were really the um, key figures for this, these projects. I am funded by National Institute of Aging, of course, the uh, GCRLE, um, which is an, it really is an amazing source of fun, uh, funding, the NIDDK and the HEAL initiative, because we do also look at sex differences in the gut. And here is a list of our collaborators, and I'm sharing some uh, Black Lives Matter art that I went down to Oakland and just shot pictures of. So thank you very much. And I hope I didn't go over time. <laughs> no, no, that was great. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much. Um, to everyone in the audience, I forgot to mention, um, please put your questions into the Q&A. Um, we're going to have a big discussion at the end uh, with Holly and Polina. Um, and so ask your questions as they come up and we will answer them at the end. Um, it's interesting that you said you want to recruit more PIs to work on this, Holly. This is definitely one of the focus areas for the GCRLE is to build this network of people and scientists and, and people outside of science, even clinicians and um, people in tech to focus their attention on this problem. So one thing that we've done is um, to try to bring people in from outside is to um, open the first ever ovarian biology core facility. So we're calling it the reproductive biology hub. Um, and so we can invite you know, scientists who don't work in this area of biology to um, collaborate with us and we can help train them and their, and their, um, their students and postdocs to do experiments uh, in this area. So yeah, yeah that, spread that the will, word. That will be great because every time you create one of these models and then you have to look at all the, the endpoints, you know, having a place to go where you really have the expertise to look at that tissue that you want to look at, just like I was looking at bone, I had to go get bone people to look at it. I can look at an ovary, but it would be great. You know, that's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, asset to have as you're doing this type of research. And, you know, if you've got a neuroscientist, they don't really feel comfortable all the time looking at reproductive or peripheral tissues. Yeah. Just they don't like, want to look beneath the neck, right? Right. <laughs> they don't want to, they usually don't want to look in the subcortical regions below the cortex. So right. um, I think that um, the more crosstalk we can have in this area will be great because just like there's people that work in peripheral tissues and they never really want to work in the brain. Uh, but these are all very interconnected as, uh, you know, just talking about this one patient, you can really see how important it is that these connections stay intact to really maximize reproductive success. And, longevity, I'm sure that, you know, we reproductive longevity that we really, you know, getting into that is, is, a, is another thing, but it's something that we need to think about. And I do think it's going to take um, decades of work to really tackle this problem. And I think it takes, it's going to take multiple labs working on this to, to go after it. Yeah. Yeah, yep. well, the Reproductive Biology Hub is open and for business. And so anybody who's interested in the audience, um, look us up. Uh, thank you for that, Holly. That was wonderful. Um, oh, it was a pleasure. And we'll come back to you for questions at the end. So okay. um, please put your questions into the chat if you have, if you have any. Um, all right, I am delighted to introduce our second speaker. Um, Paulina Lischko is an Associate Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California at Berkeley. She also is a member of the Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality at the Buck Institute. Um, and again, she has won a lot of awards and has a, a really amazing career. Um, so I'm just going to mention one thing that she recently uh, did. She's a 2020 MacArthur Fellow, so she's actually been recognized as a genius. 
Um, and Felina's lab has um, spent a lot of time developing really advanced biophysical and cell biological techniques that um, they've used to characterize bioactive lipid signaling in reproductive tissues, both in males and females. And I will say that her discoveries related to reproductive physiology have really, I think, transformed the field. Um, and for those of you who don't know, changes in lipid signaling and the levels of bioactive lipids and steroid hormones, this really goes hand in hand with the progressive decline that we see in female reproductive tissues with age. Um, so she's going to talk to us today about a project that she's doing funded by the GCRLE, which um, is aimed at discovering new lipid signaling pathways that are likely to play a role in age-related processes in the ovary. So welcome, Polina. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, good morning, Singapore, and good afternoon, everyone uh, in this part of the world. Thank you for, uh, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Sean Wei, for the opportunity to join this initiative to increase global awareness in of the importance of reproductive longevity and reproductive health to have a better longevity. Let me tell you about what our lab is doing. So, okay, here we go. So uh, Holly did beautiful presentation on the importance of the steroid hormones, particularly estrogen, and the regulation of uh, multiple plethora of multiple physiological function of our organism. And in fact, uh, steroid hormones uh, participate in multiple important function. And most of the way uh, the textbook version, how we know how steroid hormone function is by changing gene expression, by going inside the cell, binding to the receptor and eventually translocating to nucleus and changing the way how the cell uh, activates the gene expression, which plays a great role in tissue development, tissue proliferation, and so on. And it took almost several decades for the scientific community to recognize the importance of their of this uh, signal reduction pathway. And in fact, that such a small molecule as steroid hormones can implement a dramatic function in our physiology. However, there is another pathway which is uh, less recognized, but nevertheless is also important. The way how steroid hormones can change physiology of the cell on a slightly different um, uh, scale. So this pathway is known as non-genomic or membrane steroid signaling, and it initiates with the steroid hormone binding to the membrane receptor located on the surface of the cell. And sometimes this binding can happen on the, from the outside of the cell, and sometimes steroid hormone binds to the receptor uh, under uh, you know, from the extracellular side. However, within seconds or milliseconds, this binding leads to the opening of ion channels or activation of GPCR signaling cascade. And while the signaling is fast, it can lead to dramatic rearrangement of the bioactive lipid landscape of the cellular membrane, and eventually the outcome of this pathway could also have a profound function on the, on the, cellular, um, on the cellular physiology and cellular function. So um, our lab uh, was very interested for quite some time to understand the mechanism of this non-genomic steroid signaling. And we were looking for the, uh, we were looking for the model when the genomic, classical genomic signaling is absent. And I only briefly mention this model because this is not going to be part of my talk. And um, uh, what I'm going to talk today about is about two or two tissues, two organs, when we're specifically looking at the non-genomic steroid signaling in the ovary, a particularly ovarian stroma, as well as the non-genomic signaling in the brain uh, epithelia, particularly in the brain ventricles. Um, so the model we initially focused on was not close to any of those. We were particularly interested in a uh, sperm cell as a model, which uh, because the sperm cell are transcriptionally and translationally silent. They don't have by definition any genomic steroid signaling. However, they rely heavily on steroid hormones to fulfill their action. In fact, that's how sperm cell finds the egg. They are able to change their motility from the normal symmetrical tail bending, which allows them to swim from point A to point B to the hyperactivated hypermotility mode upon exposure to progesterone, which is released from the ovulated egg. Oops, I'm sorry. So here, as you can see, this 
uh, hypermotility mode, which is triggered by exposure to progesterone. And what progesterone does, it basically triggers almost immediate influx of calcium ions into the sperm tail, which powers this motility mode and allows this tiny guy sperm cell here to turn into small mini drill and penetrate the egg and fertilize it. So by using sperm cell as a model, we found out a mechanism how steroid hormones, how progesterone fulfills its action and activate this calcium channel allows calcium to flow in. And in this case, the culprit was an enzyme, a steroid binding enzyme, which is located near this uh, ion channel, calcium ion channel, the enzyme which is known as alpha beta domain containing protein 2, hydrolyzed domain containing protein 2. It's a mouthful, so we call it, it ABH2 for simplicity. It's, the name is ABH2. So, what ABH2 does, it binds progesterone, and by doing so, the activity of this enzyme is triggered, so the enzyme is able to hydrolyze an endogenous cannabinoid, a bioactive lipid known as 2-arachidonyl glycerol, 2-AG. And ABHD2 hydrolyzed 2-AG by producing another bioactive lipid, arachidonic acid. The 2-AG is known to be an inhibitor of several ion channels, including calcium ion channel in the sperm. So by exposure, by uh, exposing themselves to progesterone, sperm cell activates an enzymatic activity which cleaves an inhibitor the calcium ion channel, allowing this channel to open, calcium flows in, and that's how sperm cells are able to fertilize an egg. So um, after finding this out, we decided to look where else this enzyme is expressed because uh, we found out its expression in uh, other tissues such as brain, smooth muscles, as well as gonads and ovary. It's a very simple, a relatively simple protein with one single transmembrane domain and the catalytic site. And its evolutionary is one of the most conserved enzyme, enzymes with 99% identity among all mammals. So its steroid selectivity is also amazing in a way that it can activate it by progesterone and at a lesser extent by pregnenolone sulfate. However, testosterone, estrogen, and cortisol do not activate this, the function of this enzyme. So we decided to look at the ovary to find out where exactly this protein is expressed. And it turned out, uh, as you can see for, on this immunohistochemistry images, that on the level of mRNA, it's pretty much abundant in the ovarian stroma. So, and in, if you look at the immunohistochemistry, that this enzyme is stained by green, it's uh, expressed in cells right between the follicle. So just a, big, a quick primer on the ovarian morphology. Ovary as abundant in follicles, as you can see here in this big uh, structures with the hole inside, that's where the egg resides. The follicles are surrounded by the protective tissue of the tica and the smooth muscle tissue, which is shown here in pink. And everything, and of course, when ovary, when follicle ovulates, when egg uh, releases, the follicle turns in the corpus luteum which is seen here. And as a corpus luteum is the main, uh, the tissue which produces progesterone to sustain their uh, potential pregnancy. So ovarian stroma is a quite diverse tissue, which uh, is different from reg um, regular stroma uh, structures in the way it doesn't have too much extracellular matrix, but it has plenty of different cellular types, such as immune cells, uh, fibroblast-like spindle-shaped cells, as well as an um, interesting endocrine cells. We know very, uh, uh, we don't know enough about ovarian stroma, although the function of the ovarian stroma is critical for supporting the normal ovarian function. So um, we did a knockout mouse uh, by using CRISPR easy technique, which is the modification of classical CRISPR method by electroporating zygotes, that's what EASY stands for, electroporation of zygote, and delivering Cas9 into zygote. It's a very efficient way to generate mice on a relatively fast uh, scale. And uh, as you can see here, over is devoid from um, ABHD2 um, protein now. So surprisingly, what we found that those mice have altered estrous cycle. They spent more time in estrus than in the pre -estrus. 
and they also ovulate a larger number of eggs. And this tendency stays with mice as they age. In fact, we were able to get successful breeding of some of those uh, mice, even when they are 12 months old. So the ABHD2 is expressed in the subpopulation of cells, and right now the lab is working on, on identification of their uh, function and um, uh, the physiological significance of those cells, what exactly they express, whether they have a specific biomarkers in addition to ABHD2. And uh, now I would like to switch gear and tell you about another relatively novel project that our lab is doing, and tell you about another organ which is uh, uh, under very potent regulation by steroid hormones. However, this organ is less recognized in overall uh, neuroscience uh, field. So the organ is known as a choroid plexus and is the main tissue which produces cerebrospinal fluid. So um, it's uh, the choroid, we have four of the chor this choroid plexuses they are located in each of the four brain ventricles. Uh, shown here on this cross section of the human brain. And the function of the choroid plexus, uh, there are three main functions which are absolutely crucial for normal brain function. So first is of course protection. Our brain buses in the cerebral spinal fluid and whenever we shake our head, right, our brain doesn't just hit the skull, it's protected. Uh, fluid serves as a shock absorber. The second function is bu buoyancy. Our brain is a heavy uh, object. It weighs about 1.5 kilograms. However, suspended in CSF, it only weighs about 25 to 50 grams. And of course, uh, that helps to maintain brain density without cutting off any blood supply. And the third, the last but not the least, which is extremely important function of the CSF cerebral spinal fluid, is removal of the toxins, waste product, and uh, producing, providing brain with uh, all the required uh, vitamins, ions, and oxygen, and hormones. So in a way, uh, the choroid plexus serves as a janitor of the brain, or also sometimes is called as a kidney of the brain, because the function of the choroid plexus cells uh, as, uh, could be only compared to the secretory uh, function of our kidney. So in a way, uh, the choroid plexus is assembled in, in a simple way. There is a one single layer of the epithelial choroid plexus epithelial cells, shown here as a CPEC, and the blood capillary in between. So as uh, at any given time, we have about 150 mil of uh, cerebral spinal fluid. However, this organ is able to produce almost 600 mil per day. So the renewal and cleaning of our brain happens four times per day. Essentially, we have cleanup of our hard working neuronal system four times per day. And as we get older, this efficiency goes down and 77 year old human, the uh, turnover rate is about three times per day. In an Alzheimer patient, it goes down to two. So in a way, the Alzheimer uh, patient could be viewed as people who have a decreased level of the cerebral spinal fluid clearing and the CSF is accumulating a lot of toxic byproduct and so on. So um, what is not surprising, uh, what is interesting is that the decrease in the function of cerebral spinal fluid turnover goes hand in hand with a decrease in sex hormonal production rate. And we know that when women hit menopause, the level of steroid hormone circulation goes down, as well as testosterone in men who hit andropause. Alzheimer patients, uh, there is a high prevalence of women among Alzheimer patients, almost like two thirds of uh, Alzheimer patients are women. And some correlation exists between when women hit menarche later in their life or the menopause starts early in their life, those women have higher rate developing Alzheimer's disease later in their life. So there is a peculiar uh, connection between steroid hormone and the function of choroid plexus, which is also known in the case of traumatic brain injury. Uh, when a patient sustain a heavy hit to the head that leads to the brain edema accumulation of, uh, of fluid in the uh, uh, brain ventricle and subarachnoidal space. And it was shown for rodents, and it went to the phase three of human trial, that injection of progesterone actually helps 
to relieve brain edema and protect the brain as well as its function of choroid plexus. In fact, it was shown that female rat and female mice have much better outcomes than male mice, and that's how the search started. However, we still don't know the mechanism behind this. And what is also interesting, that, stero that choroid plexus, adult choroid plexus, have absolutely zero level of expression of classical genomic steroid receptors. They have almost no androgen, estrogen, or estrogen receptors expressed in this tissue. However, they have high level of uh, membrane, non-genomic steroid receptors. ABCD2 is one of them, but there are others. And apparently there is a very intriguing mechanism how choroid plexus can be regulated by steroid hormones through the alternative pathway, which is uh, definitely interesting, interesting to, uh, to reveal in the future. So choroid plexus has its twin brother, and epithelial tissue, epithelial tissue, which is similar in uh, gene expression and function, and this tissue is known as RP, retinal pigment epithelium, and which is also has intimate relation with steroid hormones. For example, glaucoma is known to be not only age-related, but actually women who take hormonal contraceptive have increased rate, almost 60% higher chances to develop glaucoma early in their life. Um, the choroid plexus relation to steroid hormones is not only a traumatic brain injury fact, but migraines, which are triggered by uh, changes in the CSF level and happen in the same time as a decreased level in progesterone. Often women who suffer from migraine can um, uh, know that at a certain time of their menstrual cycle, uh, the migraines hit especially bad. And of course, uh, ovarian stroma, which I briefly mentioned at the beginning, the function of the endocrine cells and ovarian stroma, and particularly their uh, role in the bioactive signaling and endocannabinoid uh, bioactive signaling, which involved non-genomic steroid receptors and other frontiers, which would be important to uh, work on. So with that, um, I would like just to uh, uh, wrap up this talk and uh, tell a big thank you to all um, our lab member, all the former and current members, as well to our wonderful collaborators. Uh, we work with Jennifer on the role of this interesting uh, non-genomic steroid signaling in the ovary, and we are collaborating also on uh, the role of uh, non-genomic steroid signaling in the epithelial tissue in the brain, as well to my other collaborators at UC Berkeley. And thank you so much again for the opportunity to share with you our research. Thank you, Polina. That was great. Um, so we have some time now to answer questions, and we've got a few in the chat. If anyone has any other questions, go ahead and put them in there, and we'll we'll get to them. Um, so uh, Zhang Wei, I know that you have some expertise in this area too, both um, especially from the clinical side. So um, some of these questions definitely could be answered by any of you. Um, but the first one that came in is, um, how does the brain control all these reproductive functions in the body? So that's a very broad and open question. Um, and I'll let you, uh, you can just unmute and shout out. Um, I'd like to hear okay. from Holly, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> I mean, so that's really, uh, you know, that's, a, that's actually a great question. And if you look at all the textbooks, it's, it's this really simple, um, the, what we call the HPG axis. So the hypothalamus it gets triggered and then talks to the pituitary, which then causes proteins to be released, which then cause steroids to be produced by the gonads, which then feed back. And that's sort of the classic pathway in terms of the brain controlling the gonads and the gonads talking back to the brain through both the pituitary and uh, the brain. But what I think is uh, intriguing to think about is that, you know, I'm sure that there are going to be other neurons or subsets of neurons within the brain that also contribute to the gonads as well. 
Um, and because the problem is, is that much of the classic dogma can't all be explained by the data. So it suggests that it's more, that it's going to be more complex than we really realize. Um, and so I don't, I have not answered your question because I think it's, you know, stay tuned. Um, but that's yeah, a simple something- way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's right. The HPG axis, and everyone is familiar with that who's uh, learned even the most basic things about r- female reproduction. Um, in my lab, we study neuropeptide signaling. So, this is a class of signaling molecules. There are hundreds of them. And certainly, you know, gonadotropin releasing hormone is one of them, and kispeptin is one of them. Mm-hmm. But that's two out of, you know, 150 that we know about. Um, and these are, these are signaling molecules that can uh, travel over long distances and, you know, can really coordinate between the brain and peripheral tissues like the ovary. And it's kind of like, it's like the dark matter of uh, the signaling universe because they're very hard to measure. Um, they're missed in proteomics experiments and um, the receptors, you know, the sensors on the target tissues are usually expressed at such low levels that they, they don't come out in, in most expression studies. And so, you know, we're trying to develop novel ways to look at that. But I think, I think there's a whole unexplored side of things um, with respect yeah. to, uh, to how the brain and the ovaries yeah. and other reproductive organs are talking to each other. I think that's very exciting because that's actually one question which I want to re- re-ask again is that uh, what Jennifer and Holly has so well explained and Paulina especially on the side of steroid receptors and steroid hormones is that we do know that estrogen re- uh, mediated pathway is well known in uh, neurocognitive development and what not in the women. Uh, uh, there's a attending who asked, you know, it, is there any hormone independent pathway that potentially or as you, as Jennifer has already said, you know, that links the reproductive system to the brain directly, that we could also explore, you know, uh, not just the female hormones, which I, I know this is a massive thing, but, you know, what are your opinions about this? Oh, I'll let Paulina take that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a very uh, it's a it's it's a hard question, but a very important one. I uh, agree totally. Um, so we also have to take into account the adrenal gland uh, because that's another yeah. uh, which uh, another organ which is sometimes overlooked, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it plays important role. And there's also might be uh, kind of like thinking about steroid hormone production mainly in the ovary. Uh, or mm-hmm. the adrenal gland, but there are also centers in the brain which can produce steroid yeah. hormones. There could be some uh, endocrine c- cells in the brain, which we probably, uh, some people uh, some people working on this, but there is no like kind of like coherent studies of finding out those neuroendocrine steroid producing cells mm-hmm. in the brain. Mm-hmm. In, in fact, Donald McDonald had a very interesting paper, and this was focused on breast cancer, but what he found is 21 hydroxy cholesterol, which is made in the liver and the brain. And I think in one immune cell, those are the only places it gets made, um, can bind to the estrogen receptor and really serve as an agonist for the estrogen receptor. So we know it's in the brain. Uh, We started trying to collaborate with them to, to look at that a little bit more closely because that's an intriguing aspect that there are even there's another ligand that we're not thinking about mm. uh, in the brain. Yeah, right, right. absolutely. And another observation is that steroid hormones are lipids, right? So they not usually normally diluted and circulated in the plasma. They bound to some carrier proteins, mm. and that's why when we do global study and just measure levels of the steroid hormones in liquids. We sometimes can omit and misunderstood the real mm. concentration because they usually probably would be localized in the lipidal structure, such as membranes. Right. So like a local cell lipidomics or something would be really helpful to understand where are those hot spots of hormone production and steroid hormone circulation. Yeah, there's, there's this interesting question to Paulina, and, and I want to carry on with that because uh, this question is asked about your ADHD2 knockout mind. And with a high number of antrophalcos, now that, that excites me a little bit as well. And Jennifer knows that I'm very excited when we talk about eggs and everything. So, so one important question is that, do your mice oblate high quality eggs? And this, is this increase in antrophalcos due to reduction of follicular atresia? Or is it just actually activation of follicular pool? I think that's quite interesting. 
So uh, that's actually very interesting. So if you yeah. uh, do uh, uh, over like ovarian cross section, you do a lot of. Uh, they look like atretic, but they're not really atretic follicles. But when we inject mm. the supervolate mice, we're able to rescue those follicles, and that's why mm. we think they kind of like ovulate a large number, two to three times more eggs than uh, their litter mate controls. So uh, they're not undergoing premature decline. They're still there, and they mm. look morphologically as atretic, but they could be rescued with. Right. Uh, gonadotropin injection. And, and, and I had a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Holly, please. Holly, please. oh, I just had a question because I yeah. think that phenotype is so intriguing. Um, it, is all of that egg production at the expense of something else? Mm. Some other physiology? Because, you know, well, Jennifer <laughs> would be able to comment much more on that, but that's <laughs> sort of the way you think about it, right? That that if you're going to reproduce, it's at the expense of something. Yeah, we have very preliminary data right now, very preliminary that when we'll, uh, because our colony were relatively young when we started looking at it, now we have older mice. They're lost, as they become old, and we're talking about 22 months old mice, they start to produce more kind of Alzheimer-like phenotype in the way that their, their brain ventricle become larger than normal mice. Mm. But this is very preliminary, and I don't want to jump to, con jump to the conclusion. The results are exciting, but mm. again, it looks like there is some trade-off. Right. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. But Jennifer, you probably you know can join with Holly and, and Connor because I think uh, what role does the threat hormones play in reproduction and aging? I think this is a uh, something that we are actually all talking about here, isn't it? About steroid hormones and, and reproduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Holly. No, you go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I just feel like the, the, the circuit that we're looking at in terms of activity, um, clearly you can imagine that when that disengages, mm. The, the, there's metabolic consequences, right? Um, we know that that region is not so acutely important for reproduction, but at some level, it's going to be about reproductive aging. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having that circuit go offline is going to have, you know, some consequences in terms of metabolism. Uh, and th th it's clearly for reproductive aging or just aging in general, that it's pretty important to have that on board to maximize your metabolic fitness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's Come right. I mean, that area of the brain is so important. Yeah. So important for all sorts of um, organismal homeostatic systems, right? Energy and fluid balance and uh, sleep and circadian mm. rhythms um, are all kind of nearby uh, the area of the brain that uh, Holly is talking about. Um, a question came in that's related to what we're talking about here, uh, which maybe opens it up a little bit more. Uh, by studying neurons and signals in the brain, how is that going to enhance functioning of the ovary to optimize reproduction and stave off menopause? <laughs> this is a really, this is an important point because um, I think if you're not a neuroscientist, this might not be obvious. <laughs> right. So pa since you're the genius, Paulina, you can take that question. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is so tough. <clears throat> Some way, right? Um, when we talk about uh, a lot about hormonal replacement therapy, right? But and why it work or doesn't work in some case. Uh, it's interesting, and we, we actually discussed it with Jennifer uh, one day. But it's maybe we kind of t started taking these hormones, like uh, their um, current regulations. The patients started taking these hormones too late. Maybe it should be early. As the function declines of the ovary. Maybe the hormonal supplementation should take place early than when it's already too late. Kind of like as the maintenance of the hormones uh, as such important signaling molecules should be constantly uh, uh, regulated in, in our body. Again, it's a speculation, <laughs> but- 
Yeah, Paulina, that's that's interesting because I would like to jump in here because I was thinking about you know, uh, I'm we were seeing more women who are actually you know because of um uh, you know their their work commitments and and you know women are all getting so educated. Look at the three of you, lovely ladies, you know, knowing so much about this field and. And I was just wondering if if women age and conceive a later stage in lives, you know, what will happen to the ovaries? Because what actually Holly, you know, have have shown and and you know, is that uh, uh, there's also some studies as well saying that you know, being pregnant and later age, maybe they they will enhance ovarian longevity. You know, um, they will make the ovaries probably a bit more younger. I'm not sure. I mean, how is this going to affect you know, the ovaries at a stage? You know, for for me when I Look after a lady, and I tell them that while you're 47, I think your ovaries are getting shrunken and they are getting smaller. The normal follicles are gone, and probably the circuitry in your brain is all going, you know, the other direction rather than staying healthy and young. So, what do you think? Do, personally, from your studies, do you see any of these ovaries actually, you know, getting better if you do? If you think there's some intervention that happens and it would change the ovary morphology as well, to really enhance ovarian longevity. Right. So, I mean, I guess, you know, what we would, I mean, what we're starting to look at is if we, if we activate this, this uh, circuit, is that going to have an effect on the ovaries? And we're just really starting to look at that because, Mm. well, I, I guess, you know, what comes to mind, of course, is, is PCOS, which you know a lot about, which is this interplay between metabolism and, and reproduction mm-hmm. where, um, and th- this, of course, I mean, I don't know what the, uh, how many women are affected in Singapore, but it's, right. there's a lot in, in the United States. Um, yeah. And so that's an area where, what, you know, you, you you're, number of eggs really declines in your ability to get pregnant. And it's really always linked to um, metabolic impairment and diabetes, Mm -hmm. usually, and liver, liver, fatty liver disease. So um, there you would think that, okay, well, if you can maintain metabolic fitness, perhaps that's going to help uh, increase longevity in the, in the ovary. But I don't in the know other the... direction too, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, like the idea that um, you know we're talking about more than just fertility and being pregnant and being able to conceive. It's, it's really about women's health too. And yeah, um, there's clearly a link there between a woman's overall health and her reproductive s- status. Right. That mm-hmm. the longer you can push that out, the more likely um, a woman is is going to be in a peak peak fitness <laughs> peak performance yeah the another, best, you know type <laughs> yeah right. and another factor which we also kind yeah. of uh, maybe need to take into account is the exposure to stress right and exposure to all the exogenous uh, uh toxins which could mimic steroids some steroid hormones that's another mm-hmm. thing which, uh because we are in this environment and uh, the environment also affects us greatly right right Uh, There's one more question. um, Yes, last one. (laughs) Which I think is important. Can the ovary affect the uh, brain function in return? So I think... (laughs) That is a great question. And uh, I'm going to... uh, (laughs) Well, I mean, we do know it can affect the brain in terms of just the hormone production because obviously that's what's happening and there there's other peptide hormones that then can affect brain function but i think what you're asking is are these new are there new signaling pathways that we we have not thought about that would affect brain brain function and i think anything that can get through the brain, blood brain barrier and pauline is going to tell us how that happens uh could affect brain function <laughs> Yeah, definitely, uh, because uh, the way uh, steroid hormones could be carried through the, uh, or locally produced in the brain, or also going through their uh, blood by carrier protein and into uh, either CSF or choroid plexus, uh, that uh, regulates the function of the BTDL cells, which will then can regulate uh, the clearance of the CSF. That's how it could affect our brain normal function by basically removing toxins or uh, Mills folded proteins, amyloid proteins, tau proteins, and so on. 
So that's one of the way how ovary can help to maintain brain uh, uh, healthy function. Absolutely. And, and I think that it's amazing. And thank you, ladies, for sharing all your opinions and, and the amazing work. They're going to start off and going to get more exciting data. Um, and I want to say that uh, at, at NUSONG, actually, uh, we're also having this integrated women's health program, which we're looking at actually the cognitive function of uh, midlife women. And we do have some interesting uh, clinical observations as well about what we have shared so far. So I think there's more things coming up and thank you very much once again to all the attendees today. And incidentally, today is also the 15th day of the Chinese New Year. So it's Yuan <laughs> Xiaojie to all the Chinese uh, attendees. Um, and also until next week, uh, making reproductive longevity a reality. And we hope to see everyone again. Thank you very much. Thank you.